lay, uh, give us what the Lord has, has laid upon you. Thank you very much. It's great to be here with you all, and uh, thank you for, for having us. Um, um, my name is Bruce Inyon. I've been uh, pastoring over at uh, Circle Evangelical Church in Circle uh, for the last uh, seven years, and then here in as the head of student ministries uh, with uh, Evangelical Church. That was back in 2011. Uh, to 2013, uh, but then uh, before that, we were in Plevna at uh, Emmanuel Evangelical Free Church, and we were there for 12 years, so um, uh, 22 years we have spent here in eastern Montana, and now uh, we're headed to Frontier School of the Bible, where I'm going to be a, a professor and uh, teaching uh, Galatians, Philippians, and Colossians, an Old Testament survey this uh, coming fall, and then coaching soccer and uh, helping to lead music during chapel. So uh, they got me uh, roped into a, uh, quite a bit of, of uh, opportunities, and uh, we'll be serving as missionaries down there at Frontier School of the Bible. So um, I'm going to bring up the rest of the crew, and uh, we'll introduce you uh, to ourselves and, uh, and uh, let you know what's uh, been happening I know that a lot of you have seen our kids when they were about this this tall, and now now they're taller than me. And so, uh, uh, but just wanted to give you a little update on uh, who we are and, and uh, what what God is doing in our in our lives here. So, is this on? Can you hear? Yes. Okay. <laughs> Hi, my name is BJ. I am 20 years old, and for the past two years, I've been going to college up at Briarcrest College in Car in Cairnport, Saskatchewan. And I've been playing soccer and also playing intramural hockey there. You can see we won our championship there. But uh, during the summer, I've been roofing. And my plans for this year, I'm planning on hitching a ride with my family and going with them for at least a year and trying out Frontier School of the Bible. Thank you. It's been difficult because uh, the Canadian border has been closed down for so long, and so, uh, uh, yeah, the, the, just a little shakeup in, in plans for Siege, but uh, it's been, uh, it's, uh, this is how God is steering us uh, in, in different ways and directions, so. Hi, my name is Ellie. I'm a freshman in high school, and I've always loved working with kids and being with them. So I'd love to go into camp ministry, and I'm so excited to see what God has in store for me in Little Grange. Okay, hi, I'm Paige, I'm 18. Um, I just graduated high school, and being this age, I always get the question, um, what do you wanna do when you get older? What do you wanna do with the rest of your life? And honestly, I can't really answer that question yet. Um, but I'll figure it out. It, I'm not worried about it. It's in God's hands. But um, for a lo the longest time, so both of my parents have told me that they want me to go to a year of Bible college before I go to any other college just to, so that I can have that direction in my life. And so at first I was going to go to this college in Hawaii, actually, Kauai Bible College. And um, we had everything kind of set up to go visit and everything there. And we called, and they told us to just hold off for a little bit, just wait a little, because we don't, their camp is flooded, and they don't really know what's going on. And a while ago, I went to their website, and it actually said that they had closed down for good, because they couldn't find a place to relocate. So I guess it wasn't in God's plan for me to go there, but um, I had always been asked if I wanted to go to Frontier School of the Bible, and I didn't really want to, <laughs> because... Um, a lot of my family members have gone there, and I didn't want to, like, follow in their footsteps or whatever, which is a terrible reason. But um, I went to this thing called Frontier Focus that they have down there, which is a thing that they have for high schoolers um, to kind of just sit on, on some of the classes and see what you'd be getting yourself into if you went to college there. And I kind of realized maybe this place isn't such a bad place to go. So I will be going there. Um, I actually didn't, my parents didn't tell me that they were gonna, that my dad got a job there. I went up to my mom and I said, mom, I think, I think I wanna go to Frontier. She's like, great. 
we're going with you. <laughs> so you can imagine how excited I was about that. Um, <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. I'm actually really excited, especially to sit in on some of my dad's classes, because I know those will be really interesting. <laughs> so yeah, I don't know if I'll be going there for three or one year. I don't know, but I'm excited to see what God has in store. So a little bit about Frontier School of Bible. How many of you guys have heard of Frontier School of Bible? Holy cow, a lot of people. That's great, great news. Um, the, something unique that sets Frontier apart from other um, Christian colleges or Bible colleges is that they really want their students to be able to afford to come. They never want finances to hold them back from spending time in God's word. A lot of people um, go for just one year before they go into their careers just to set a good, solid biblical foundation so that they can defend their faith when they go into their secular careers. And that's great. They, they want people to come do that. Um, there's also, you know, different programs. There's three-year, four-year programs. There's missions. There's pastoral, youth pastor, camping ministry, um, you name it. Whatever different, you know, kinds of ministries there are, there are programs for that um, to prepare the students for that and they just really have a heart for youth um, and as we can see in our churches and across the nation there's you, the youth aren't coming back um, they're dropping out of church and um, they're they're not s sticking with their faith and so they just have a heart to um, disciple the, the the these youth to get to get them into the ministry um, and just ignite their hearts on fire for Christ. And it's just, it's a tremendous gift to those students that they're, they, they just, the financial aspect of it is so incredibly cheap. Um, they just want everybody to be able to afford to go for a year, or if they go into the ministry, they definitely do not want um, people to start their life out <clears throat> in tremendous debt going into the ministry. So. Uh, they try to get everyone in and out of there debt-free, um, offering not only low tuitions, but they give them jobs on campuses where they can work off even that. Um, so it's just, it's a tremendous gift to the, to the students there. So anyways, how they keep the finances low is that all of their staff from maintenance all the way up to the president of the college, every single one of them are on missionary support. Um, and that's how they afford to do that. Um, and so that's kind of what we're doing is we're going around to churches, we're raising support. Um, and so it's kind of a little bit different, uh, a little maybe uncomfortable for us, but um, it's, you know, it's what God has for us. And he's really been stretching us and growing us um, through all of this. And I'll share more. I got some more stories. I'll be up here afterwards in a little bit um, sharing the financial aspect of it but that's kind of a brief synopsis of our family um, and like Paige said we we did ask each of our children to go to one year Bible college before they go into anything that they would want to pursue and so um, it's it's just been a blessing seeing BJ up at Briarcrest up in that's just like four hours north of here and then page we're pretty excited about having both of them with us down at frontier it's the first time we'll all have lived in the same town together in several years so i'm pretty excited about having our whole family together thank you honey mm -hmm. hello and this is christy oh. all right <laughs> and so uh yep been married since uh may 10th 1998 and uh this is this is our whole crew but thank you for having us uh all here uh mm -hmm. together and and uh have a little bit more to share about that but thank you crew for for sharing there um we uh like uh, christy said the uh, part of frontiers philosophy of ministry is that uh, we are training up the next generation uh, for christ and we are training up the next uh, generation of soldiers to to go and and battle on the front line uh, because uh, the times that we live in are are changing and uh, one of the philosophies of Frontier School of the Bible is to go and train up these students and do it in the most affordable fashion uh, as possible. Um, we receive absolutely no government funding, which is good because a lot of times when you see government funding occurring within 
the educational realm, the government has the opportunity to dictate what can be taught. And so they say, oh, you can't teach that because it goes against our the common culture or, or social values of the culture. And so uh, what has happened here with Frontier School of the Bible is that we receive no government funding, therefore we can teach straight up Bible with no compromise, and which is something that is absolutely necessary in this time uh, that we live. Um, a lot of people ask me the question, why are you doing this? You know, we have lived 22 years uh, here in eastern Montana. If there's any place that we have considered called home, it would be eastern Montana. Um, uh, you know, why are you packing up and moving? You got a, a, a steady job, got a, a great school, town, um, all those things. And, and we love eastern Montana. And they ask us the question, why are you, are you doing this? And I, I will have to say the answer to that is very simple. It's because time is running out. Okay? Time is running out. Did you know, for example, according to current trends, up to 3,700 churches will close their doors this year? And due to coronavirus, that will be more like 5,000. The percentage of Americans that describe themselves as Christians is down 12%. The percentage of Americans who call themselves atheist or agnostic stands at 26%, and that's up from 17% in 2009. So you do the math right there, we have lost 10 percentage points over to atheism in this world that we live in, in less than 10 years' time. This means between 26 to 42 million people who are raised in Christian homes will disaffiliate disaffiliate from Christianity. 26 to 42 million. All right, we are sending our kids off to college and they are losing their faith over and over. All right? Given the current rate of decline, the U.S. will be a completely atheistic society well before 2050. Time is running out. And we're passing on the baton essentially to nobody. We have all this faith and we're passing the baton on to individuals that are dropping it. Scripture says in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 3 through 4, don't let anyone deceive you in any way for that day, the return of Christ will not come unless a falling away comes first. So before Christ returns, the, it says right there in Scripture that a falling away will happen. The word right there for falling away is the Greek word apostasia, where we get our modern-day word apostasy. There will be individuals that will be uh, apparently strong in the faith, but they will drop it along the way. We are in the middle of that apostasy, and time is running out on this world. There's a further statistics, only 6%, only 6% of Americans possess a biblical worldview, according to a new survey. And according to Dr. George Bernard's American Worldview Inventory of 2020, more Americans believe in Satan than they believe in God. We are missing the handoff of the baton of our faith onto the next generation. And there is a chasm between the secular world and the biblical world, those who have aligned themselves with biblical faith, and it's getting wider and wider all the time. And there will be no longer a moment where we can stand between the gap and say, oh, I'm going to live for the world or live for for God, no, the time is now that the chasm is getting much wider, and you're going to have to choose one way or another. I believe that time is running out. Why do I say that? It's because in Scripture, uh, there's biblical evidence for the return of Christ to return at any time. Did you know that no scholar of academic substance denies that Jesus lived almost 2,000 years ago? Nobody denies that. 
but yet we find three times as many prophecies in the Bible relating to his second coming as compared to his first. Three times. All right, this, the second advent of the Lord, is three times as certain as his first coming, which can be verified as historical fact. So you have three times as many reasons to believe that Christ will come again. If you believe that he came around the first time, all right, at Christmas, which we celebrate, then you have three times as many reasons to believe that he's coming back again. The second coming is mentioned 329 times in the Bible, making it the second most frequently mentioned doctrine of all scripture after the doctrine of salvation by grace through faith. Do you think there's a little emphasis in scripture upon the return of Christ? After salvation, you see the return of Christ mentioned there. It's evident right there. Revelation chapter 22, verse 12, it says, Behold, I am coming soon. I believe there is biblical evidence for the return of Christ. I also believe that there is prophetic uh, evidence for the return of Christ. So uh, this past December, we had the opportunity as a family to go over to Washington, D.C. And on, on a, a Friday morning, everybody was all tired, but me and Ellie got up real early on this Friday morning, hopped aboard the 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 subway uh, to Center City, uh, Washington, D.C., and went to the Museum of the Bible. And it is the coolest place. They spent, I think, about $500 million on this facility. And it's crazy. Four floors, all sorts of uh, uh, depictions and live-action characters depicting how we got our Bible, how it started. Uh, from the prophets, from the apostles, and then it came along to us, and it depicts it four different floors with, uh, with multimedia functions everywhere, and it's, it's amazing. And so uh, we went all throughout, the, all throughout the facility, and they even have Donald Trump's Bible in there from when he was uh, in Sunday school. Uh, it's on loan over there. And so it's, it's interesting. It's a great, great little place. So if you have the opportunity to go there, it's, uh, uh, it's fantastic. Um, on the third floor of the museum, there's a, an, a room. It's about the size of the sanctuary here. And what this room is divided up into, it's uh, in different colors all throughout this room. And so what they have is translations of the Bible uh, that are in, in languages uh, today. Okay, so you have the red section and the yellow and the orange, and that section is Bibles that are complete, and uh, the number of Bibles that are uh, available. Then you have this bluish and greenish section over here, which have partial uh, portions of Scripture translated into, into that group's language. Okay, and then this last little quarter is, is the last section, and it, there's no works that have begun uh, in that group's language, okay? And so they use this room as a, as a depiction of how the, the word of God is being displayed in, in people's uh, uh, specific language. Now, here's the interesting thing is that Wycliffe and Tyndale got together and they have, they're amping up their translation uh, abilities and what they have found out is that, and they have decided, is that within the next 10 years, the Bible will be translated into every single person's language on the face of this earth. Now, this should get you excited because in Scripture it says, and this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in the whole world as a testimony to all nations, and, they say, and then the end will come. That's happening within the next 10 years of our lifetime, okay? Every single person will have the word of God in their own language. There is happening in our society. People are, are coming to Christ in, in droves. Even though you have difficulties happening in this society today, you're seeing people coming to faith and Christ in, in innumerable numbers. Uh, do you know what the fastest 
in Iran. Growth rate in Iran. In 1970, they had 500 Muslims turned Christians. Only 500, but today in Iran, you have an underground church which numbers 3 million. And you don't hear about them because they're all underground. But they are the fastest growing church on the face of this planet. 2020, we started out this year thinking, oh man, we're going to war with Iran. But that is where the most number of Christians are growing right here and right now. People are coming to Christ in droves. There's a, just the distress of nations is occurring in our society. And so as we're seeing things happening in our society today, the question has been given to us over and over. What would you do if you knew time was running out on your life? I want you to ask yourself that question right here. If you knew time was running out, what would you do? I asked myself that question a lot this past year, and I had to answer that. I would try to get as many soldiers on the front lines of ministry and get the gospel into everybody's hands as quick as possible. And then God told me, are you doing that? And so the question is proposed to us, why are you doing this? And my answer is simple, time is running out. How would you spend your life if you knew time was running out? That's my question to you. You see, a lot of people, especially with what is happening in our society, said, oh, we just need to get back to normal life. That's the rush to it. Okay, well, but what does Scripture say? It says in Scripture that in the last days, people will be eating and drinking, getting married, and giving in marriage. They're going to get back to normal day life. And then Jesus says that's when the flood came upon Noah. When people were just living life normally. I believe that even after what we have experienced this past year. This past few months. We should not be trying to get back to normal. This should be a wake-up call for us to realize we need to get the word of God into people's hands. We need to get the gospel into many people's lives as possible. We need to get as many soldiers as we can on the front lines of ministry. What should we be doing with our lives? That's the big question. We've asked ourselves that, and I'm asking you that today. Thankfully, this book right here, greatest book on the face of the planet, has the answer for us. It's listed all throughout, but we're going to detail one specific area. It's Matthew chapter 25, and it's verses 14 through 30. Let's take the time to, to, to read through this, because that, I think that it's, it's very familiar to us. But also, I believe that it's important for us to get a good context uh, for where that Jesus is, what he's trying to communicate to us. So Matthew chapter 25, and we're going to look at verses 14 through 30. I'm going to read the entirety of the passage, and then we'll detail what, what is happening in here. Okay, 25, starting there in verse 14. For it will be like a man going on a journey, who called his servants and entrusted to them his property. To one he gave five talents, to another two, to another one, to each according to his ability. Then he went away. He, had received, he who had received the five talents went at once and traded with them, and he made five talents more. So also he who had two talents made two talents more. But he who had received the one talent went and dug in the ground and hid his master's money. Now, after a long time, the master of those servants came and settled accounts with them. And he who had received the five talents came forward, bringing five talents more and saying, Master, you delivered to me five talents. Here, I have made five talents more. His master said to him, Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a little. I will set over you over much and turn to the joy of your master. And also who had two talents came forward saying, Master, you delivered to me two talents. 
Here I have made two talents more. His master said to him, Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a little. I will set you over much. And turn to the joy of your master. And also he who had received the one talent came forward saying, Master, I knew you to be a hard man, reaping where you did not sow and gathering, where you scattered no seed. So I was afraid. And so what I did is I went and hid your talent in the ground. Here, you have what is yours. But his master answered him, you wicked and slothful servant, you knew that I reap where I have not snow, sown and gather where I scattered no seed. Then you ought to have invested my money with the bankers, and at my coming I should have received what was my own with interest. So take the talent from him and give it to him who has ten talents, for to everyone who has, who has will more be given, and he who has, and he will have an abundance. But the one who has not, even what he has will be taken away. And cast the worthless servant into the outer darkness in that place where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Let's get a little bit of context for what is happening here in the scripture. And, and since uh, I'm headed to be a teacher, professor, I'm going to use the whiteboard, okay? So if you're following along, you see in the scripture that they were all given a measure of money now a talent as mentioned in scripture is not giftedness or abilities or things like that what a talent is is a measure of money and according to reputable uh, biblical scholars it's an amount worth 20 years wages okay so let's process this and do a little bit of math so here in montana you make eight dollars and fifty cents an hour if you're a minimum wage worker. So we're going to do this. We're going to translate what the money that is here mentioned in scripture and put that into modern day thinking. So $8.50 uh, per hour, okay? And then you multiply that by 40 hours a week. So you make about, you know, and I'm going to average this out, you make about $350 per week. Multiply that by 52 weeks a year, a minimum wage worker will make $18,000 a year. Now, it says in scripture that they were all given a talent. A talent is worth 20 years wages. We take 18,000, multiply that by 20. For our understanding, a talent is worth $360,000. Just one talent. $360,000. Now, you notice in the scripture that it says that the first guy had five talents. That's 100 years wages. So that is worth $1.8 million. Can you imagine that? Being that servant and the master says, here, I've got a suitcase for you. $1.8 million. I'm going to leave for a while. You do whatever you need to with my, with my goods. What would you do? Okay, the second guy comes along, all right? He is given two talents. All right, that is worth $720,000. Okay? And you feel bad for this last guy. Oh, man. He only gets one. No, man. $360,000 he is given. Now the master goes off. He returns. And he settles accounts with his servants. The first guy comes up. He says, I have, you give me five. I have multiplied that by two. I, I'm giving you ten. So he comes back and gives his talents over to the master. And he gives him two suitcases full. And it is $3.6 million. Amazing. All right. Second guy comes along. All right. Master, you're giving me two. I'm giving you four back. He winds up with $1.44 million. And then this last guy, oh, you feel bad for him. And he's like, I knew he's going to be hard on me. I knew he was difficult. So I just buried it in the ground. All right. I want us to take a note of what happens in this scripture as we're going along. If you notice there in verse 14, it says that the master entrusted his possessions to them. Notice what our possessions are like. They are not our 
own. Okay? Principle number one, God entrusts to me what is his by right, and it is mine by responsibility. Can you say that with me? God entrusts to me what is his by right, and it is mine by responsibility. What you got in your wallet, what you got parked out in the driveway out here, what you have at home, it's not yours to begin with. It's all his. Christy and I, we had to learn that in a big way early on in our marriage. Got married May 10th, 1998. Just young kids, all right? And uh, we were headed out to be a missionaries church planning down in, in uh, Denver, Colorado with uh, Rocky Mountain Bible Church Mission and, and Cherry Creek Bible Church. And uh, we got married and then, well, we got, we graduated from, from uh, Frontier School of the Bible in 98 on May 8th, and then we got married on May 10th, and then we spent our honeymoon in the Scotts Bluff Regional Hospital because she got appendicitis on our honeymoon. Okay, so, you know, the, the preacher gets up there and says, you're going to love for better, for worse. Yeah. Richer for poorer, all of a sudden we are $10,000 poorer. Sickness and health? Yeah, we, we had to learn very early on what our vows were all about. But here's the thing, is that when you give your heart to God, when you give your life to God, when you give everything to him, you can never outgive him. He will always give more back to you. When you do ministry, when you do life his way, it will never lack his supply. And so what we had to learn is something that Corey Ten Boom said. Is she said that hold everything in your hands lightly, otherwise it hurts when God pries your fingers open. Okay, so I want you to think about your finances. I want you to think about your health. I want to think about your life. How hard are you gripping onto it? Because I have noticed in my life every single time that I'm holding, holding, holding on to it that God says, no, I need you to let go. And I'll tell you, it's painful when I have to let go. But when I have my hands open to him, guess what? Yeah, he can take a lot out. But because your hand is already open, guess what? It can put a lot more back in. Would you be willing to worship like this, to give your heart and life like this, with an open hand. And I have found, yeah, he has taken a lot. But I'll tell you, because he is a gracious, compassionate God and one who loves us like a good father, he's going to put a lot more back in. So what you need to do is hold this life very loosely because it's all his to begin with. It's his by right. It's ours by responsibility. Okay? There's a second principle that I see in this scripture is that faithfulness is my primary obligation. Can you say that with me? Faithfulness is my primary obligation. I notice in the, in the scripture it says the master calls his servants to him. And you got the guy who gives five over and the guy who gives the, the two over and they have doubled it. Notice what it says in the scripture. He says, well done, thou good and successful servant. Right? No. He said, faithful. You don't have to do these huge, amazing, perfect acts of love and service and submission and all those things that we are called to do as believers we just have to be simply faithful in those tasks faithful to complete them someone has calculated that if the widow's two mites 
all that encounter, that narrative in Scripture, if it had been deposited in a bank at 4% interest, compounded semi-annually, by today it would have grown to the sum of $4.8 billion trillion. Okay, that's 4.8 with uh, 20 zeros after that. The two mites. Here's that old hymn, little is much when God is in it. You can never outgive him. We just have to be simply faithful with what he has entrusted to us. The Bible says that he who has left houses or lands, brothers or sisters, father and mother, for my sake, will he not inherit eternal life and a hundred times as more? And such is this. You can never, ever outgive God. And faithfulness is just our primary responsibility. There's a third thing that I see in the scripture is that inexcusable irresponsibility is judged. Last servant comes up and says, you know what? I knew you were a hard guy, so I just took what you had given to me and I just left it to the side. I knew there was a lot of risk. I knew that there would be difficulty when you have entrusted these things to me, so I'm just going to keep it quiet here and just keep it to myself. And then I'll give it back to you. A lot of people think they can skate through life just like that, but God comes along and says, you wicked and worthless servant. Couldn't you have just given it to someone who would invest it for you and then I would be able to go and have interest off of what I have given to you? Can you imagine that? God coming up to you giving $360,000 and saying, I don't know, I'm just going to leave it alone. That would just be a squandering of his blessings. But yet, people do that day after day after day. You've been blessed so much, especially here in the United States. We have been given so very, very much. We spent a week out in, in Guatemala and saw these little kids with lice. And they were absolutely joyous over receiving a bar of soap. Okay, and here we are without even realizing it, how very blessed we are and we, we take for granted these blessings we have been given. Those who have been given much, much will be required. So I'm asking you today, would you be willing to not bury it? A lot of you have been blessed in so many different ways. You've been given gifts beyond all that I could ever imagine. If I can look back in my life, there are individuals in my life that have decided not to bury what God has given them. And it wasn't very much. It was just their heart and lending their life to me and to my family. There are three heroes I would call recall in my life that made a difference because they did not bury their talent for one it was a it was a a private in the japanese army during world war ii his name was private moriyama he was a radio operator he was 17 years old when he was conscripted into the japanese army and he hated the war and he didn't want to be a part of it he was the only christian in his unit but yet he was assigned to the same island that my father grew up in, in the Philippines, on the island of Negros. 17 years old, and my dad was seven at the time, and he loved the Indian family. And this 17-year-old radio operator would go off and he would sneak little bowls of rice or little bowls of soup because there was a massive famine that was happening there on the islands of the, of the Philippines. And what had happened is that the radio operator, Private Moriyama, was on the radio one night and he heard, overheard on the radio waves that the United States, the Americans, were going to go to the island of Negros and they were going to carpet bomb the whole entire area because it was a center for, for kamikaze attacks there in the Philippines. And so they were going to carpet bomb the whole entire area. This private 
heard what was happening over the airwaves, and he was like, what should I do with this knowledge? Only Christian, 17 years old, and he decided right then and there that he was going to disobey the orders of, of his military commanders. You know, what would happen if he would let on the secrets and the things that were happening over the airwaves? What would have happened to him? He would have been beheaded right in front of his unit. But yet he took this knowledge and he went out to the Indian family over there in, on that island and he told them, all right, you need to get out of here as quick as possible. Head out into the hills. This whole entire area is going to be leveled. So they packed up what they could and head out, head out into the mountains. And then that night they saw the bombs fall and the lights flash and the fires burning. And they went down to the city that very next morning and the whole entire area was flattened. And guess what? They never heard from Private Moriyama ever again after that. I owe my life to a 17-year-old who decided he would not bury his talent. I'm asking you today, don't bury what God has given to you. You have been given so very, very much. Don't bury it. And it may be something very small, or maybe something very great, but don't bury it because the, what you do with that may save lives, lives like mine. There was another hero I would consider that was very instrumental in my life, and his name was Dr. James Boyd. 1976, April, April, uh, in 19, yeah, April 25th, that's my sister's birthday. April 25th, 1976, my mother had my sister. Her name was Brenda. And then uh, just a couple months later, she found out she was pregnant again. And she was going through postpartum depression. It's like, oh, I don't know if I can do this. So she decided right then and there that she was going to go and have an abortion. And she decided that uh, right there in Center City, Philadelphia, I just can't take this anymore. I got, got three rambunctious older boys, and then they got this daughter, brand new baby. I can't have another one. So she went down to Center City, Philadelphia, told my dad, oh, I'm going to go have a procedure done. Didn't let on that she was going to have an abortion. Went down to the, an abortion clinic right there in Center City, Philadelphia, and then she was sitting there probably 10 minutes away from, from having this done to, to kill this child. And then she was sitting there in the waiting room and then looked on the wall, and there was this poster for 10th Presbyterian Church. And the poster said, don't sacrifice the life that God has given you. Every life has a purpose. And it said, this is from Dr. James Boyce with 10th Presbyterian Church. Call this number. She was sitting right there, and she, there was a phone in that waiting room. So she picked up the phone and said, called up. Dr. Boyce answered the other side, and she said, I have no idea what I'm doing here, but I, I saw your poster, and I, I need help. And he told her, just wait right there. I'm going to take one of my elders with me, and I'm going to go talk to you, and, and uh, you know, just wait right there. Don't do anything. So she went and waited right there, and then uh, Dr. Boyce took one of his elders, some guy by the name of uh, C. Everett Coop. Might know that name? All right. He was a, some big wig in, in the Reagan administration, certain general, something like that. I don't know. Um, but took his elder with him, and they sat with my mother right there in that waiting room and said, Prima, God has a purpose and a plan for this child. And don't throw it away. Even though you're feeling going through difficulty and going through struggle, God's going to do his works in and through your life and through this child's life. Don't make the mistake of throwing that away. And so they prayed for her and they said, we will covenant with you to pray for this child and that, 
God will do whatever is necessary in his heart and his life and then in your life as well. So nine months later, December 1st, 1977, I was born. I owe my life to a private Moriyama. I owe my life to a Dr. James Boyce, and I'm named after him today. My name is Bruce Boyce Sinyan. Because of these two men who didn't bury what God had given them, I'm alive today, and my family is here. And I'm asking you, there's a kid down the road here who needs what you have. There are people that God has placed in your life and you have been blessed beyond comprehension. They need what you have. And I'm asking you, don't bury your talent. Please, don't bury what God has given you. There was another one in my life, Dr. No, Mr. George Fry. He was my Sunday school teacher, sixth grade. I was this greasy-haired, nerdy teenage kid. And he said, you know what? I'm going to hang out with these kids, and I'm going to love that Bruce. And I will say to you that I would not be here today be if it wasn't for George Fry, who taught Sunday school for us junior high kids. Instrumental in changing my life. My Sunday school teacher. You teach Sunday school? Don't underestimate what kind of impression you will leave on these little kids. If there's one thing that I can leave with you, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to invite Christy here, is he is no fool who gives up what he cannot keep to gain what he could never lose. You've been blessed eternally. And if you would just share that with those who are around you, I'll tell you, life's changed. We are grateful for this opportunity to be with you today. And I'm asking you today, going forward, just don't bury it. Use it all for his honor, for his glory. I'm going to invite Christy, and she's going to share a little bit more about well, what God's doing in our hearts and lives. And then I've got one last little illustration to share with you. Yeah, so I mentioned earlier it's just going around and raising support has been a little bit different for us and a little bit challenging. Um, but I just want to share a story about when we went to our, we started this process um, the end of January. So we went to our first church and um, I was super nervous about it, but um, God just really showed me that he was going to take care of us. Uh, it was just super neat. After the service was over, there was a gal there that had filled out a pledge slip that she wanted to be um, a monthly supporter of us and I sent her a message afterwards and I just said I just wanted to thank you you know so much for being our first supporter and just how much it meant to us and it it just was so like her pledge too was just super generous and I just wanted to let her know that God just used her to encourage my heart and um She's like, no, thank you. She said, you have no idea. She said, like, four or five months ago, God had laid it on my heart that I was to be giving above and beyond our tithe to our local church. And she said, I had this amount set in my mind, and I could not figure out where to give it. She's like, I've researched different missions, different things, and I have had no peace. And she's like, I was sitting there, and um, she said it was just like God was saying, that's who I had that money for. And I thought, oh, my goodness, what? How awesome is that? Before she knew we had a need, before we knew we had a need, God had that already lined up in her heart that um, she was to be one of our supporters. So that was just a, a huge wow God moment to me that he has us taken care of um, in that way. And so it's there's been lots of stories like that, but um, it, it's been... Everything, we started in January, everything was going great, COVID hit. Uh, we've been shut out of churches for two months. Um, we were supposed to be completely raised by the end of May. We are currently at 60%. We are not supposed to move there until we're at 90%. But guess what? We're moving Friday because they need help. 
Um, they, they already have us on the schedule and they need Bruce and we're just trusting God that he's just going to take care of us. Um, and that's kind of what this process has been a whole new different way for us to grow in our faith and to trust God through this process. And so, um, our needs are actually pretty tremendous right now. Um, this stinking COVID thing has really gotten our the way of our plans, but guess what? Like we said, they were not out of God's plans. He knew that was going to happen. He knew we'd be shut out of churches for two months. Um, he knew all this was going to happen. And so um, I guess when he does provide in his way and his timing, it's really going to be a miracle because, you know, we look at it from our earthly point of view and we're like, how is this going to work out? But we know God's called us there, and we know where he has called us, he will provide for us. So we're just trusting God in that manner. We have a table back there. Um, please stop back there. Um, there are several things I'll just kind of show you. First of all, there's a prayer card. Um, take it. Stick it on your fridge. When you see it, pray for us. Um, working with youth down there and getting in God's word, preparing them for ministry, you can only imagine the amount of spiritual warfare that's going to be down there it's going to be tremendous and um we need people praying for us we truly do not look at this as um you know our thing we we need a team supporting us we we view it as um you guys partnering with us in ministry um and so there's also these little slips here which can be mailed back to this address here and this is if you feel so called to partner with us in prayer on a regular basis if you would like to commit to pray for us um, daily weekly um, we're looking for people that would just lift us up in prayer and also on here is a um, spot to check if you if God's calling you to partner with us monthly um, in ministry that's on here too but um, we don't want any sort of pressure or that. We want it to be a God thing. We want him to lay it on people's hearts. So, And we know he already has it lined up. It's just finding, making them connections and finding the right people. So um, anyways, if you would pray about either of those, um, mark the slip, send it back to that address there. There's also, if you decide to partner with us monthly, this is probably the most important form. It's the form that you fill out from your bank, and it is mailed to Frontier and it comes monthly out of the debit. Uh, there's also our latest newsletter. We've been doing newsletters since February, I believe. Um, and we send them out every month. We update you where we're at in our support, what's going on, what classes Bruce is going to teach. I'm sure there'll be more, way more once we get down there. But um, So that's back there. But also, if you sign up on this clipboard, Anybody can sign up on this. This is just our monthly newsletters, and they'll be emailed instead of mailed, which saves us a lot on, po on postage. So um, there is that to sign up back there, too. Uh, so anyways, um, that's kind of where we're at uh, financially in our needs. Um, we're super gra grateful to be here. It's great to see old faces from Glendive. We know so many people here, and it's like our home. So thank you guys for having us. Been every spent like every summer out at EMBC here, and so um, Larry said that he would want us back. Uh, so I'm leaving my schedule open to, to go and do that uh, coming up in, in during the summers. But I wanted to give you one last little illustration. I want you to imagine, you know, this uh, this rope right here. It goes on and on forever. Okay, but I don't have that much rope. Um, so it just stretches on and on and in from here all the way to to eternity all right and I want you to imagine that this is actually a timeline for everybody on this planet so how you spend this life is how you're going to spend the rest of eternity Okay, and that goes on forever and ever, millions, billions, quadrillions of years. I don't know how long that is, all right? But what we have here on this earth is just this little red portion right here. Okay, you got this little amount of time right here, then it ends, and then you got all of eternity. How you spend this little bit 
is how you're going to spend all of this. But a lot of people, they look at their life and say, oh, man, look at that. Oh, it's a long time. All right? So I was born right here, and then I graduated high school. I went off to college, and I got a career. And guess what? I'm going to save up so that I can uh, retire someday so I can really enjoy this spot right here. And I'm thinking, what about all of this? You forgot about this portion? A lot of people approach their life to that, and I'm asking you, don't throw away this little, little bit for all of this. What did, I, what did we say earlier, Jim Elliott? He is no fool who gives up what he cannot keep. And this life is so very short. It's here one day and it's gone the next. You're no fool if you give up what you cannot keep to gain what you could never lose. So I'm just asking you today, don't bury it. Use it while you got the chance. Hey, thank you for having us today. Um, I'm going to close in a word of prayer together. Lord, thank you for Community Bible Church. Thank you for a group of believers, like-minded believers that don't want to bury it. They want to use it. All that you have given us in this earth for the honor, for the sake of bringing others to Christ and to bringing the next generation into the nurture and admonition of Jesus. Lord, I pray that we would be found faithful in these very little things so that one day you'll be able to look at us and say, well done, good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy of my rest. Lord, that's what we're focused on. That's what we will press on towards the high calling that is in Christ Jesus. So bring our hearts and thoughts into what you have for us today. Help us to seek first your kingdom and your righteousness. Lord, bless this body. Bless all who have gathered here today. Lord, we love you. We thank you for Jesus. Thank you for his salvation, for his giving of his life to us by the sacrifice of his blood and of his body on the cross. That's why we worship today. Lord, thank you. We love you. And we pray all this in Jesus' precious and holy name. Amen.